Okay. The attack of delay, excuses, substituting money for value. I think we know what that is. Attacking the problem. Getting right on what the difficulty is. Okay? It needs to be attacked. Now, here's the best way to attack the problem. It's the second word. Confess. The best way to attack a problem is, first of all, confess you've had the problem. Because part of this helps to identify with people. When you're getting right on somebody's case, you know, be willing to identify by saying, hey, I've had the same problem. If somebody's making excuses, just use yourself as one of the best illustrations. Say, hey, John, I made a million excuses. I always tried to excuse myself for not getting the job done, not progressing, not moving up, not accepting the challenge. I had all these excuses. And finally, I found out they weren't working. They were keeping me from being successful. You're getting on somebody about doing it now. And just use yourself as a good illustration of letting it slide. Anybody here ever let it slide? Yeah. See, we've all let it go. Just go back and dig up some of that stuff. Even though it's a bit painful, go back through it. See, let me, I had a chance, just like you, I said, well, I'll wait till next time. And sure enough, it was gone. And let the pain show and let the difficulty you had show through your voice and through your experience as a confession that you've had the same problem. One of the best ways to get on something is, first of all, confess you've had the problem. Now, here's another way. Confess for someone that isn't there. This is where you gather up all the stories. I know Mary. I know John. I know somebody that had the same uh, challenge that you're having. They said, well, I'll let it go. And if they were here, they would tell their story. And they're not here, so I'll tell their story. Make sure you learn all the stories that help to illustrate the things you're trying to solve. Confessing for someone else. Okay, that's the attack and confess part. Now, there's another subject under attack and confess that's very important called tools of last resort. Tools of last resort. Here are some things that you can use as a last resort. And underline the words last resort. Here's some things you don't want to use unless there's no hope left. But if the situation is serious enough and you've gotten into a, a presentation situation or a, you're talking with somebody, you're trying to solve a problem, trying to get something done, get somebody to buy, get somebody to change, whatever, you might now have to get what we call right down to it. And here are what we call tools of last resort. But you should only use them sparingly. Use them only if there's no hope left. But it's serious enough and you still have to get the job done. And here they are. First one is a direct attack. Now, see, you've got to be very careful of a direct attack. This is where you get right on somebody's case directly. Say, John, let me tell you what I think of your current situation. A direct attack. Now, you've got to be very careful of a direct attack because it's now starting to get personal. Instead of confessing yourself, Instead of telling another story to illustrate it, now as a tool of last resort, if you've got no choice left, you can't get the job done unless you resort to this. You can resort to it, but you must be careful. Here's what you don't want to do in a direct attack. You don't want to strip someone of their dignity. You leave intact a person's dignity. But still get the problem solved. And a direct attack is one way of doing that. If you've got a little sales organization going, right, and you're trying to recruit somebody in your sales organization, they say, well, I don't know whether I want to or not. Right, and this has gone on and on and on, and back and forth, right, and you've made the presentation. What shall we do? Okay, then you just look around for some way to make a direct attack. You say, well, John, how long do you want to sit on this old shabby living room furniture? Now, see, that's what you call a direct attack, okay? It means you're getting right down to it, okay? Now, you don't have to do this, right, until it's kind of there's no hope left. Always remember this in the, in the communication process. 
Give people the fun reasons for doing it first. Give them the easy reasons for doing it first before you get to the hard reasons. It's like attending a seminar, right? Hey, everybody's going to seminars. Guys, is okay. Where's my ticket? Right? Everybody's going. Just go. That's kind of an easy reason. That's a fun reason. Hey, to keep up on what's going on, you got to go see everything. Okay, fine. Here's my check. I'll go. Right? Give people fun reasons first before you get to the difficult reasons and the hard reasons. Okay? Make it easy. One of my staff members said to somebody one time, you got to go listen to Mr. Rohn's seminar, the evening seminar. It's three hours. It's a lot of information. Uh, I think you'll enjoy it. The guy said, hey, look, I've been to all those seminars. And my staff member said, wonderful. Filled out the ticket, handed it to him, said, here's your ticket. Give me your check so that you can continue to say, I've been to all those seminars. <laughs> That's easy, right? Guy says, you got me, right? Here's my check. I'll go. That's right. Let's go for fun. Everything is not grim. Everything is not just terribly serious, right? If it's fun, go for fun. If it's easy, go easy. But now then, if all of that is not working, now you come right down maybe to the hard part, to the strong part, to the severely direct part. So that's a tool of last resort, a direct attack. Here's another one, scolding. That's a tool of last resort. You don't want to resort to that unless there's no hope left. Because scolding can really cut. And sometimes it can cause damage if you don't do it very carefully. But sometimes scolding is effective. But only as a tool of last resort and only utilized with great care. See, if somebody walks in late and you say, where have you been? See, that's loaded with insinuations. Just the tone of your voice says you don't care, you're careless. You just, you've got to be very careful of scolding. Parents have to be very careful of using these tools of last resort all day long. You just don't want to use them all the time. Because to get somebody's attention, you might cut them a little bit on the finger, right? And it'll heal and it'll be okay and you've gotten their attention. But see, you don't want to take off the whole hand, right? You just got to make sure when it's time to do some cutting that you do it with great care. Now, here's another tool of last resort, sarcasm. The who do you think you are? Now, see, that's effective in the right place, but you got to make sure it's only a tool of last resort. I don't mind a minister consigning my soul to hell fire for my sinful ways. I don't mind that, as long as he does it with tears and not with joy. <laughs> okay. See, if somebody really cares, then they can get right on your case, if they really care. And that mixture of really caring and pointed discussion can bring the most phenomenal results. But you still have to learn to use it carefully. Remember, so many matters in conversation are matters of the heart. Matters of the heart, matters of the soul, matters of the spirit, as well as matters of the mind. So you've got to be careful. See, you don't want to operate on the heart with a hatchet because you'll lose the patient. You've got to operate on the matters of the heart and still leave the dignity still leave somebody with their sense of well-being. Get to the problem, but don't destroy the person in the process. But that's all wrapped up now in this attack and confess, getting to the problems, finding out where the hitch is, finding out where the snags are, finding out where the excuses are, finding out where the weakness is and try to make it strong, finding out where the delay is, the procrastination. You just got to find out what the problem is. If people don't decide and if they don't change and if they don't buy it, you know, there's, there may be some, some of these reasons here, some of the negative sides, so you've got to learn to handle that. Okay, that's the third part to the presentation, attack and confess. Now, here's the last part to the presentation. It's called solution. In every presentation, make sure you always leave somebody with a solution. Solution. Now, one of the best ways to paint the solution is to paint your own solution. If you've got some solutions, you're trying to get somebody to decide, getting them to buy, getting them to join, getting them to change, use your own story. Paint your own solution. Here's how I feel. 
I finally went through the process. I put it off, but I finally decided, and here's what's happened to me. Here's where I am. Here's how I feel. Here's how it looks from my point of view. Paint your own solution. Then also learn to paint other people's solutions. Let me tell you about Mary. Let me tell you about John. Let me tell you about someone else I know, someone your age, somebody in your particular situation. If they were here, they'd tell their story. But they're not here, but let me tell you their story. They did it. They bought it. They changed. They decided. That's powerful. Always leave somebody with a solution. Now then, if you're really skillful, you can put the person in the future solution. Say, John, I can see you now in your new position, walking tall, up off your knees, no more begging. I can see you now in your new lifestyle, looking good, feeling good, self-confidence. And you can't imagine what other people are going to start saying about you. Your whole family, everything will change, right? You start painting this future solution and put the person in the future solution. Shof was the master at this. He'd say, Jim, I can see you now with your new bank account, wearing your new clothes, driving your new car. Right? He said, I can see you in your yacht. And he would paint those pictures and have me willing to do most anything. He said, I can see you. He said, I can see people walking up to you. This new person that you've become, congratulating you, watching you, watching your progress, wishing they were like you, wishing they were around you. I can see it. He had me dazzled with the future. And I've got a good phrase for you. The promise of the future is an awesome force. The promise of the future, and it may not be too far away, it may be tomorrow's future. If you decide today, tomorrow you're going to feel better. You walk taller tomorrow just deciding today. Before you get the tangible results, you get the intangible results of feeling. That's why discipline has such an incredible effect. The final reward of discipline is one taste. The beginning of discipline is a whole new taste. In fact, the beginning of discipline might even taste better than the finished product. Say, I'm now doing it. I haven't got the job done yet, but now I'm doing it. I didn't used to, but now I am. And see, when self-confidence soars, that's when things really start to change. Now, if you're able to paint those pictures, paint the solutions, paint the future, give somebody a reason to go for it, paint their new house for them, paint their new feelings for them, design this picture. We call it learning how to paint results in advance. That now makes an incredibly effective presentation. Now, for Mr. Schof, he had to keep this up for a while because I would, he'd have me all sold on these pictures of what I was going to do and where I was going to be, right? Sailing my own yacht. But when I got away from him, sometimes I'd lose those pictures. I'd even call him on the phone and say, tell me that yacht story one more time, right? Uh, I'm out here in the middle of it. But leave everybody with a solution, the possibilities, the potential, because the human potential is unlimited. Okay. Now then, How to make a presentation, identification, logic and reason, attack and confess and solution. Just make that a little mental tick list now. When you get ready to make a presentation, you get ready to talk to somebody about something, whatever the situation is. I've got to identify. I've got to be brief with the logic and the reason. I've got to find out what the problem is and see if I got an answer for it. Find out where the hang up is. Find out where the hitch is. And I've got to do it with care. But if it's necessary, I've got to be direct. But I've got to feel good about it. I've got to leave somebody with their dignity. And then I've got to learn to paint pictures for solutions. If you will just keep those points in mind, your whole conversation, communication, and the way of presentations will start to change. Okay. Now then, I have a little subject here called communication priorities.
So if you've got a fresh piece of paper, you might put it at the top of it, communication priorities. And then let me give you a little diagram here that I think was helpful for me in learning to zero in on communication and where it's the most important and how to divide it up. First of all, draw a circle about the size of a silver dollar somewhere on your paper, if you've seen a silver dollar lately, whatever. A couple of inches out from that one, draw another one. And then a couple of, a couple of more inches out from that, draw another one. Something like that. I call these worlds of communication, communication priorities. On the inside circle, put number one. This circle here is number two. This one is number three. And this outside is number four. Now, on the inside circle, put family and close friends. Inside circle, family, close friends. We call that the inside world. That's your personal world, your private world. Okay? Now, number two, I call this your work world. Your work, your job, your business, the office, okay? That's your work world of communication. Third is the community. These are the schools, shops, the community. Number four, I call the outside world. Outside your normal activity of family and business and community. Okay, now, I've, I've drawn this diagram just to call your attention to the importance of the various worlds of communication. First of all, there's the outside world. And just be a little more conscious of communicating for your own betterment and, and better life and communicating with people of other cultures. This could be another city, another state. It could be another country. Okay, outside of your normal area. And guess what? You've got to really try hard to communicate with people from various parts of the country, even our country. Yeah, they talk different down south. If you don't know what y'all means, you, you got to find out what y'all means, right? They talk about grits. You say, grits? I never heard of grits. What's grits, right? So we all need, right, to learn the language, the style, right, and uh, the colloquialisms of different parts of the country, right? You have to communicate different with the New Yorkers, people in New Jersey, New York. They're a little more abrupt in their communication. They are. And that, a lot of times, that's not just because they feel bad or they're gruff and mean. It's just because it's kind of their, the way of living. To get to, to get to work in New York, you have to push. <laughs> or you will not arrive. <laughs> so guess what? If you push every morning, you become a little pushy, right? And usually that shows up in your conversation. I mean, some of it is just sort of part of the lifestyle. It really is. You sit down in a restaurant and the waitress says, yeah, what do you want? Now, see, you just got to learn to take that well, <laughs> right? And it isn't that she's mean, it's she's got, you know, 99 million people to work on, right, or to wait on, and you just, you know, now you just have to learn that. When I first went to New York, I, when people talked with each other, I thought they were angry, <laughs> right? That they were mad that the fight's gonna break out, right? I'm looking for cover. So they, we're gonna need some help here pretty soon. And I found out, no, that's just sort of normal. They always, you know, go right at each other. That's just sort of part of the style. Now, if you don't understand how to communicate, right, and get along in another part of the country, sure enough, when you go traveling and so on, you, you'll get confused, okay? Now, even when you go to another country, take along a little dictionary and try to learn some of the words. I'll tell you what, it'll just go better. When you're in Paris, you learn a little French. Uh, 
the cab drivers and everybody will just give you a whole much better treatment if you just try. You don't have to speak the whole language, but if you just try, just try. Everybody appreciates when you try to speak their language. You try for a few words, right? And you'll get mixed up a little bit and, you know, probably be a, you know, a good joke on you, right, when you've mixed up some of your words. Uh, but that's kind of fun, right? You wind up with a hooker instead of a beer, right? I mean, you just... <laughs> just because you missed the wrong word, right? But anyway, you just try. Just get out there and try. Communication is a... Is a, a lot of it is trial and an error. I say something and see how it registers. And, you know, if it's a little awkward and you give me a little help and pretty soon we got this thing going. So, communication in the outside world is just a matter of exerting more effort, being more pointed in your ability to try to communicate with somebody else, things just go much better. Now, the community, that's a great place to be a little more interested than most people are in communicating. You've got to communicate with the variety of people in the community. Don't just know what's going on in your business, know what's going on in other people's businesses. What's happening in your office and what's happening in your business and how are things going? When I first met Mr. Shope, he suggested that I start meeting with some of the other people in the community just to keep in touch, right? Meet with the lawyer, meet with the banker, meet with somebody else. I got a little group started. We met Tuesday morning for breakfast, right? Two of us got together and we invited the third one and the three of us invited the fourth one and four of us invited the fifth one. And first thing you know, we had this little group together and we had breakfast every Tuesday morning and we exchanged ideas about what was going on in, in various businesses and various uh, other people's backgrounds, right? What's happening with you? What's going on in your business? How do you find things happening? Be a little more community conscious. When you walk into the cleaners, you just chat a little while, right? Just be a little more community minded. Now, some of the guys belong to uh, service clubs and that's helpful. That's helpful. Just this exchange of ideas, this exchange of awareness is what's going on in the community. And also in this community are schools. Some parents never take the time to go visit with the, the, the teachers that are teaching their children. They just let that slide and sort of take it for granted that everything's going on okay there. But just don't let that be one of the things you take for granted. You know, go visit the teachers, find out what's being taught, find out what's going on in the community. Okay, that's another part to point up on on communication. Now, this one, of course, in your work world, that one is terribly important because that's where your income is going to come from. How to communicate with people on the job. Here's a good thing to do. No matter what you're doing, find out what everybody else is doing in the office or in this company or the corporation. If you're in sales, find out what's going on in administration. If you're in administration, find out what's going on in sales. Okay. If you're a secretary, you just don't, you're just not interested in being a secretary. Ask other people about their job and what they do and what's happening so that you get this better communication going on in your work world. People of other businesses, here's a good phrase to remember. You cannot succeed by yourself. We've all got to be more aware of what's happening around us and what's going on. Boy, it's easy to take everybody and everything for granted. So easy. We pick up the salt in the morning, casually salt our eggs, never give it a thought where the salt came from. Who mined it? On whose back did it ride when it came out of the salt mines? Who packaged it? Who shipped it? Right? Who sold it? How did it get here so conveniently? We take so many things for granted, so many conveniences we have, and there's a whole string of people involved in our comfort and our safety and our success. It's not a bad idea once in a while to just start making a list of all the people you can think of that have something to do with your success and your comfort and your well-being. You can't believe how long the list gets of the people you just couldn't do without because they're all a part of your success. So you can't succeed by yourself. So the more you know how to communicate in the business world and the work world and what's going on in enterprise and commerce, the better off you'll be. Now, the inside world, family and close friends, that one is so very important because that's what affects everything else. And I've got a good phrase for you. Everything affects everything else. 
How it goes in your number one world, family, close friends, greatly determines how it goes outside in your business world, community world, outside world. What affects you there greatly affects all that you do, every enterprise you undertake, what all you try to do. It all starts inside. And that's the easiest one to take for granted. It's so easy to say to people that are close to us, they already know how I feel. They already know what it's like. They already know, you know, my ideas and my expressions. No use telling them over and over again. Yes, you must tell them over and over again. Don't fail to communicate here because this really affects you. Now, let me give you one more key in this. Uh, either sometime during the weekend or after you leave here, just make a little note to yourself. Make a list of the people that are in number one world. Just put the actual names on a list. Who do you consider that's sort of on the inside of your life that revolves around you, inside, personal, close friends and family? Identify them. Now then, do the same thing with your business world. In my business world and community world, I've got three primary lists. Number one, priority list in my business world. These are the people I must keep in touch with almost every day. You know, I can't let more than a couple of days, two, three days go by, but what I'm in touch with, these major people, and I actually have them on a list. I have them identified, okay, so that I won't miss anybody. And in case there's somebody that isn't on there that ought to be put on there, I review this list constantly, number one. Then I have a list, number two, these are the people I must keep in touch with once a week, maybe once a month, whatever. I've got to keep in touch by phone, by letter, by personal conversation. Okay. Then I've got another list, number three. Occasionally, every once in a while, I've got to hear from, I've got to talk to, I've got to go see, I've got to write to this list. Then we've all probably got number four, right, called Christmas list. Right? which we dust out at least once a year, right? Say, well, these people at least have got to get a card from me. But what I want you to do is just be a little more conscientious about not just having the Christmas list, but these others and actually putting the names in there so that you don't miss in this world of communications the things that are important to you because of all the things we hear about that could very well be a problem between human beings. This is probably it, communications. One of the exciting things I'm finding out now in uh, traveling around the world, English is becoming sort of the common international language. And it's a lot better now when you go to a lot of other countries and, uh, you know, a fair share of them now are learning English in schools. And sure enough, if we have a common language that we can all interchange and we can understand each other a little better simply because we talk the same language, because I've noticed in translation, sometimes things get lost. I'm having a real challenge now in uh, doing my seminar through interpreters, right? When I go to Taiwan, this Chinese lady, she is so good. But what I do is sit down with her and I say, now, here's some of the stories I'm going to tell. And she'll, she'll say, well, that makes sense in English, but it won't make sense in Chinese. So I got to change my stories, right? I mean, some things just don't go over. Uh, you know, in another culture and from another language, they, it, just, it just doesn't make sense. And a lot of the stories and stuff we use sometimes is strictly American, right? And it, it would only be funny or humorous to an American. So uh, it's very interesting how to communicate, how to make sure we understand each other. So when I tell the interpreter, the translator, uh, here's the story. She says, well, it doesn't make sense. Well, I say, well, here's what I'm trying to get across. And she'll say, well, tell the story this way. I say, okay, fine. Then I learned how to alter my story so that it makes sense in uh, Chinese or Spanish or Italian in working through uh, interpreters. Fascinating. Of course, it's also interesting now when a big share of the audience speaks English. And you, you, but, but I'm using a translator, right? I say a couple of sentences and then the translator interprets for me. Uh, when there's a mixed audience, some of them understand English and some of them only understand like Chinese. Uh, if you tell a story, right, and you hit the punchline, uh, the ones that understand English, they laugh, right? <laughs> Then when the interpreter gets through, the other half, they laugh, right? <laughs> and then the first half laughs because the other half laughed, right? You get this thing going. It's 
fascinating. But anyway, the challenge of communication, age, business, social, children, family, making the lists, writing the letters, making the calls. Just make sure from now on, after this weekend, you spend a little more time fine-tuning your communication, your ability to communicate, and then setting up the priorities of communication. Make sure that the important people don't get left out of your communication process. Okay. This whole thing will start to fit together better.